guys doing all right? How about you online? You doing all right? Okay, cool. All right, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, hit on too, we every every year we, we've got a certain number of things that we do. We're not the kind of people that want to do things just to do them. We like to, to make a difference. We like to do things that matter. We say that all the time. And one of the things we do every year is they changed the name of the group. It used to be the Rape Crisis Center, and now they call it uh, the Phoenix Foundation for various reasons, uh, legal and stuff like that. But a few years ago, somebody came up to us and said, there's a rape crisis center in the county seat, and what happens is if a woman is assaulted, when she goes to the police, they take her to the doctor of the hospital, and her clothing are then confiscated as evidence. And she frequently then leaves the hospital, or the doctor, whoever she is, in a hospital gown, which just magnifies the trauma of what she's been through. And we were like, oh, how do we help this? And they said, well, really, the, the, the sweats, if they give, give them sweats, they can wear sweats. And so the first year we said, okay, we'll, raise, we'll get sweats. We collected so many for them that the next year we had to come up with something different to do for them because they've got lots of needs in, in this ministry. And so every year we set aside this month, the month of March, and we go through and we listen to them and ask them, okay, what do you need this year? Because just understand, this is how our church works. We're going to give you so much of what you ask for that you're not going to need it for a couple more years. So you've got to tell us something different every year. So I don't even know what this year's need is because we've got it on, if you can go to this link, linktr.ee slash crisisoutreach. Or if you go to the app, you can hit the events. And there's actually, there's a place you can pull down a shopping list where you can go to the store and buy stuff and bring it here and we'll take it to them. You can also, there's an Amazon shopping list. So you can just go in there and pick out some of those items and buy them. And if that's too much for you, there's a place to just give money. I mean, there's like three or four ways you can help. And by the end of the month, whatever it is they're wanting, we're going to give them two or three years month of it because that's how we roll. Okay, so if you're new here, understand, when we do something, when we see a problem, we don't just slightly address it. We do our best to eliminate the problem so the people we're helping can move and deal with their other issues they have to work with. That makes sense? So you're going to hear about this all month long, and by the end of the month, we'll have made a real difference again, because that's what we do, okay? Now, starting a brand new series today, and I'm going to start with just telling you about one of the most important sermons in the Bible, also one of, if not the longest sermon in the Bible. I'm not going to read it to you, um, but there's a guy named Stephen, and he's preaching, and they record it. It's a very long, it may be the, I think it's the longest single point sermon in the Bible. It's in, in Acts chapter 7. And Stephen does this whole long sermon before some religious leaders, and what I really want to start with is not as much the sermon as the response. Because it says at the end of the sermon, now when they had heard these things, the sermon he preached, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Point one, lesson one, you don't know what's going to happen when some guy named Steve preaches. You just, there's no way of knowing how it's going to work out. Um, by the way, stoning is illegal in the United States and highly discouraged in this region, okay? But my question would be, or your question probably is, what did he say? I mean, I've had people ticked off at me after sermons. It's part of the business. I've never had anything like this where they were so furious, they literally killed him for his sermon. Well, the biggest thing he said, he said two primary things, and the one that was the, the most time-consuming, the one he spent the most time on, was he went through everything about Israel's history and pointed out the temple wasn't that important. That God could be worshipped anywhere. And he, he went through Israel's history and he analyzed all the different times that God was worshipped or God spoke outside of the temple area. Um, by the way, this is like I said, one of the most important sermons ever preached. It gave the early church their theological background to go into all the world. Until they had this sermon, they, could, they were not ready to go into all the world. And I did it, um, Stuff Steve Says, uh, I did a blog, pod, podcast, video slash audio, 
of that teaching that, that thing. It's at stuffstevesays.com if you have a, well, that sounds intriguing. I'd like to study that sermon. I've got it on, that's where you can find that. It's on the front page, okay? So he says that. D doesn't matter where you are. Religion's not about location, which got him upset because they were very much about the temple. If you go through the whole Old Testament, a lot of it is about you need to worship the right way in the right place. But then he concluded it with saying this, name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered. In other words, religion's about Jesus. Faith should be about Jesus. And we told him it didn't matter about the place, they didn't need their temple, and they needed to switch to thinking about Jesus, they snapped and executed him, killed him. Because perspective changes things. How you view things changes things. This is a few years old, but I love this picture. Um, what do you see? It's not a super trick question. Camels. But what you think you see are camels are not camels. You think you're looking at camels, you're not. You're not. These are camels. These are shadows of the camels. Someone was flying over a herd of camels at just the right time of day where the sun was coming at this angle and it made perfect shadows of the camels and your perspective changes everything. Wait a second, that's a camel. That's the shadow of that camel. And perspective is very important. What P Stephen did was he challenged the religious leader's perspective on religion and they got ticked off. So I thought, we're going to do a series on perspective. Stephen did a sermon on perspective on religion and he got executed. Maybe I should start there. So today, we're going to be doing a better perspective on religion. This picture has no deep meaning. I just think it's cute. The boy's perspective, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about religion, and some of you are going, I'm not a big fan of religion. Some, uh, I've always said for years, and they, people, somebody says to me, um, I don't like organized religion. I go, well, I practice more of a disorganized religion myself. But religion, what, what is religion? This is the Steve Davis definition. Webster doesn't say this, but I think it's accurate. Religion is humans seeking a connection with the divine. divine. It's seeking a connection with something bigger and greater and beyond us. That's what it really is about. And so, well, the first thing we need to know about that is what Stephen taught. Is that authentic religion is not about a place, it's about a person. Stephen went to great length. Like I said, he spent a long chapter explaining why it wasn't about a place. He concluded with what, how it was not about, a, it was about a person, the one person, Jesus Christ. Which leads to the next point, and from now on it's going to get uncomfortable. Because you've agreed with me up till now. And then I'm going to say the next line, fill in the next blank for these of you taking, filling in your blanks. And you're going to agree with me when I start. You're going to spend the next minute or two agreeing. And then slowly as we move, you're going to agree with me less and less because I'm challenging your perspective and I'm asking you once again and reminding you the stones in the parking lot are not fit for stoning humans. They're defective. You don't want to use those. We'll just keep moving. But authentic religion is not about a place. It's about a person, and that person isn't me. See, here's where the problem comes in. Most of us want to build a faith that's about us. It's about our needs, what we like, what we want. And that's incredibly defective because a faith about me is just as screwed up as I am. And one way we express this, now, now this, is, this is for, it's when somebody says this, I'm spiritual but not religious. Now on the surface, it kind of sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, that appeals to me a little bit as somebody who doesn't like formalism and who has, for much of my ministry years, kind of moved away from a lot of the strictures and the stuff that go with religion. But there's a problem here. When you say, I'm spiritual but not religious, what you tend to do, well, here's how Leonard Sweet puts it. Spiritual but not religious 
is an act of consumeristic tourism at best. As one wanders the aisles of the supermarket of religions and picks out this and that as mementos of one's visit. What we do when we say we're spiritual but not religious is we're going in and we're saying, you know what, I really like Jesus when he said that. But I'm not crazy about it when he said this. So Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I say, how about I love my neighbor a lot? And how about this neighbor and this neighbor, but not that one? And we go through the, the, the laundry list of all the things that are taught by the Bible, taught by Jesus, and we pick and we choose. And then we may, if we choose, walk out of the Christianity department of that supermarket or superstore and walk over to the Hindu section and say, you know what I like about this stuff? They got some real good stuff in this section. This is a good stuff. Oh, you know what? Islam has these two really cool things. And you know, I read this book by this 30-year-old guy who had some really deep stuff to say. And we end up with this thing we've built ourselves. And we're spiritual, but we're not religious, we say. But spiritual but not religious is often an attempt to make a God in our own image it's built on who we are what we want how we want to be happy and it's a God who may make us feel good but who lacks any ability to make a difference in our lives or help us truly connect with God and so we end up with something that takes away some of the guilt but doesn't do any good so we're going to talk today about what I need when it comes to religion, how I need to change my perspective on that. And we're going to go to John chapter 1. John 1 is John explaining Jesus. Okay, He's going to talk to us about who Jesus is, and it's going to help us understand when religion is not about a place, it's about a person. That person is Jesus, not me. What do I know about that person? Well, in the beginning, it says in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And the first thing I want you to get about that is authentic religion requires someone bigger than me. Because here's something we, we need to admit and acknowledge. We were created in the image of God. And I, t I think I mentioned it last week. God created this universe as a sort of a temple, a place where he could be worshipped. And he placed us here to be the administrators, the organizers, and the chief worshipers of God. We're created to worship. It's in our DNA from the very beginning. Being made in the image of God means we desire to worship, and we're going to worship something. And what this is saying is we need somebody big enough for us to worship. See, I'm not big enough. I'm not worth, worth worshiping. But the fact is, this is... um. Ralph Waldo Emerson. A person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. Everybody worships something. An atheist chooses something to worship. He doesn't call it God, but he still worships something. Worship is that which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts, and what we choose to worship will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us. He wrote a long time ago. He said behooves. We don't really use that much, but therefore it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. And here's the problem. When I worship me, when I put me at the center, I don't call it worshiping me. But when I put myself and my needs and my desires and my wants at the center, I worship myself. And I, this is, I see this all the time. Instead of becoming a better person, I just become a more intense version of myself. I bring all the failings that I have and I distill them down into a more pure essence. But everything that I don't like about me follows me as I worship me and becomes more and more and more and more intense. And I see that all the time and all of us have it because we want to be happy. So we choose the things we think will make us happy. We, we, we want to be this and we choose... Because not only do I need worship, authentic religion requires someone smarter than me. Because, OK, 
Okay, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to claim to be an idiot. But I have done some dumb things in my life. Anybody, anybody got, got a list of stuff that you, you, any, got, you got anything in your life? If you're somebody who, who blushes, do you have things that you can just think about them and blush? You can be sitting by yourself at home watching TV and it comes up in your head. You remember how I did that? Oh, and you start turning red. Because, man, I have done some stupid stuff. Kids don't say stupid, but I'm allowed to because I got a microphone. Okay? And authentic religion requires someone smarter than me. It says in, in continuing in John 1, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human descent at, at a husband's will, but born of God. We're not smart enough to get this right. We don't have enough experience. Let, let, me, let me give you a, a little story on it. Let's say you're just getting married. For some of you, that's looking to the future. For some, that's looking to the past. For some, that's looking to the past two, three, four times. But we're looking to the past. You're getting married. And on your wedding day, your grandmother comes over to you. And your grandmother, I'm going to make you up an imaginary grandmother, okay, because... I don't know if yours will fit this, but I'm going to make one up for you. This is your imaginary grandmother and your imaginary family. Your imaginary grandmother comes up to you, and she's been married to your grandfather for 60 years. They hold hands in the store. They make sly little jokes to each other to this day. They find ways to help each other any chance they get. They raised really great kids. And she has 60 years successful experience in marriage. And she walks over to you on your wedding day and says, hey, can I get five minutes? And she takes you off to the side and sets you down and says, I just want to tell you what I know about how to make a marriage successful. Are you going to go, get lost? Get out of here, Grandma. I don't, I don't need you. I, I, I just read a really good book by this 30-year-old single guy about how to make marriage work. And I, I, I do not need your stuff. He has so many more followers on social media than you do. You don't even have a TikTok, Grandma. Why would I listen to you? Well, God's smarter than us by a lot. And God loves us more than our imaginary grandmothers do. Jesus said this. He said to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, I, I need someone bigger than me that I can worship, and I need someone smarter than me that I can obey. Now, we don't like that word. We think it's a terrible word, but here's, here's the deal, folks. Not only is God smarter than we are, God's not screwed up like we are. The two truest things about you, the truest thing about you is that you are made in the image of God. You are created in the image of God to be like God, to seek a relationship with God, to worship God. You were created for that. But you're also a fallen creature. As a result of the fall of all humanity, you are a fallen creature. So you are a rebellious creature and you do things, you'll even do things self-destructive just because you're rebellious. Anybody ever done that? You've done something, you knew ahead of time it was a bad idea, but you did it you're, anyway because I'm going to be my own person. I am doing things my way. That's a pretty good song and a terrible life goal. Because you do things your way, you're going to screw it up obedience is the path not because God's mean because God's smart and he loves you because here, here's a truth that we don't focus on enough Jesus' teaching provides the best path to human flourishing if you want fulfillment if you want joy if you want love Jesus' teaching takes you there you know where your teaching takes you? Yes, you do know. You've been there. 
when you're doing things your way and you're, you're making sure it's going to go the way you want it to go and you are just creating a house of garbage that's going to burn down. Some of you are right now, some of you right now online and here in the room are standing in the smoking rubble of the house you built for yourself. Using your own wisdom, your own intelligence, all your bestest stuff and your best self-help books, you're standing in the rubble and it's smoking and you're almost hopeless, feeling hopeless. But God's over here saying, no, this is the way, this is from Isaiah, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, this is the direction, this is how you get to the best, because Jesus gives us the path to flourishing. And his standards aren't arbitrary. He didn't just make them up. I don't seem to have this idea that God's rules and regulations and principles are just something he just was like, should we say steal or not steal? You know, we're gonna, let's, let's, let's work through the list. We're going to say steal or thou shalt steal or thou shalt not steal. Anybody, okay, and he goes through the, with the angels. They're up there having, a, having, having the business meeting where they're determining the Ten Commandments. And they're going through and they're going, okay, all in favor of steal? One, two, three, five. Not steal. Oh, my, oh, there's 27. Okay, okay, thou shalt not. We have this idea that God just sort of arbitrarily came to rules. No, not stealing is the best path to human flourishing. Because do you know anybody? You may not know anybody personally. You ever heard of anybody who got in trouble for stealing a lot? Yeah. It goes against our divine nature. It goes against the image of God in, un, in us. God's standards aren't arbitrary. They're the revelation of a being who knows us infinitely more than we do and who loves us. A whole lot better than Grandma loves us a whole lot more than Grandma. And so if I want to have religion that works, it can't be about me, and it needs to be about someone who's bigger than me and smarter than me. And then the last little piece. Authentic religion requires someone better than me. Are we all honest enough? to own up to our failings everybody reach the point where you don't pretend you're all that in the bag of chips is everybody old enough to know just an inkling of just how screwed up you are I do I, I'm really I mean I'm I, 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 I got it and what I need and what Jesus brings to me is integrity Let me, let me give you a quick integrity. Here's, there's kind of like three of all of us. Three. We're not. There's this one. There's the public version. Anybody have a public version of you? This one smiles more. All right. This one's got it together. This is the this is this this is the good version. Then there's the private me. And private me is willing to admit some failures. Some people get to know the private you. There's, there's the public you that everybody knows, and there's the private you that you let a few people in. And you acknowledge your failings and your weaknesses, but then there's the curled up on your bed me. Holding the teddy bear with your weighted blanket, feeling completely incompetent, inept, and scared. And we don't talk about that me. Integrity, it's when we let Jesus into this me. And he starts fixing this me so that this me and the private me become more and more the same person. So that what fears I still have, I'm not hiding. And eventually, for some people, more and more, the private me and the public me merge. And when the public me and the whole back of the room me completely are one person, that's integrity. 
Integrity is when what you say matches all three of you. And Jesus kind of showed us the way on integrity. It says, the word who is Jesus became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Wherever you met Jesus, public Jesus, private Jesus, there was no back of the bedroom with the teddy bear Jesus. It was the same person. He may speak in a louder voice because of the different crowd. He may use different illustrations. But the stories are the same. The life is the same. The person is the same. James is talking about that. And he, he gives us a pretty good picture of integrity. In his letter he said, Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And that's the person who, in the private, acknowledges the weaknesses, acknowledges the failures, but forgets them when they're in public, forgets them when they're at work, forgets them when they're around regular people. That's the person who looks at himself in a mirror and forgets what they've seen. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. Oh my gosh, there's a word. That's a, that's a real word right there. So the person who, let, let's, let's, let's work it through here. The person who worships a God in Jesus who's bigger than they are and smarter than they are and better than they are will be, and here's your word for the day blessed what's that mean? does that mean you just sneezed? is that, you know, English for gesundheit? no blessed comes from the Greek concept of happy what have we got? it means happy it's someone who is content someone who feels good about themselves blessed and he's saying that the person who has integrity, the person who is obedient to God, the person who is worshiping God for who he is because God is the only one worthy of worship be blessed will be happy, that's one perspective one religion, on faith that I am worshiping a God who's bigger than I am and smarter than I am and better than I am. But do you know what a, a lot of people do? I'll give you an illustration. Kind of flesh it out. Anybody seen the Sistine Chapel? Been to Rome. Seen the, I've, I've, I got to go a few years ago to the Sistine Chapel. It's pretty amazing. Michelangelo painted it over a period of years. And it's a ceiling and it's got the, like the entire history of the Bible is in this painting. It's pretty spectacular. It's pretty amazing and um, I wish I'd gotten the audio tour so they could have explained pieces of it while I was looking at it because to me it was just amazing. I didn't get all the details because it was really in it's intense. I mean, I think it's bigger than this ceiling would be and it's all by Michelangelo. And he's pretty good. Now, imagine somebody walks into the Sistine Chapel and they look around for a few minutes as long as they're allowed there's always a crowd, and they get moved out of the crowd. And then they say, you know what? I like that a lot. I'm going to make my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th and you're meeting with them a couple days, like a week later, not a long, a week, a week later. They've had a whole week. And you're talking to them, and they go, how's that Sistine Chapel thing going? You said, I'm finished. You're finished? Yeah, I've created it. Really? And they pull up a paper. And you look at the paper and go, that's um interesting. What is, is that um watercolor on canvas? No. It's Crayola on copy paper. C could you point out any, any where's the creation of, of, of the universe? I know that's in the in the Sistine Chapel. Oh, I, I didn't have room for that. But I got this piece over here, 
and you're looking at it going, yeah, I, I think you missed a thing or two. I, I, I think you, I think you, I think you undershot. That's what we do when we decide to be spiritual, not religious. That's what we do when we decide to build our faith around ourselves. Because for one thing, our God's not big enough. If your God's you, you ain't big enough. Your God's not smart enough. You know how you're not smart enough. I, I, I don't need to spend a lot of time, but I'm sure if we had conversations, we could have a really entertaining dinner where we just discuss the parts of our lives where we're not smart enough. And I'm not good enough. I don't... If, if you think you should model your life on me, you, you need to work on that. It's not a good idea. I mean, if you want to follow me as I stumblingly follow Christ, okay, that, that can work for both of us. But recognize, I'm stumbling just as much as you are. I may have been at it longer. But I'm not doing it significantly better. But I'm pursuing someone who is bigger and better and smarter. And, and this is, this is kind of important with the Sistine Chapel thing, I'm not following alone. The whole spiritual, not religious thing, what it does is it takes 2,000 years of church history and it wads it up and it throws it away. Because I have to do it on myself. I have to use my crayons. I can't borrow from any of the great thinkers throughout the history of the church. I don't need to know about them. And I'm not saying you should go home and get Augustine City of God and read it, but you should be aware that we've been working on this for 2,000 years. I didn't wake up on Tuesday and create Christianity. Okay? Christianity is a religion, a faith that's been built by very intelligent people studying the most intelligent person who ever lived. And they figured a couple things out. And when we sit down and say, I'm going to do it myself, you're wadding that up and you're holding up your Crayola on copy paper, Sistine Chapel, and saying, I want to follow this. And pardon me if I say, what you're following is crap. It's worthless. It doesn't have the weight to support you, let alone anybody else. So can I challenge all of us to fix our perspective a little bit? Quit basing your faith on you. Because you remember the camels? We thought we were looking at a camel. What were we looking at? A shadow. And if your faith is based on you, it's just a shadow. If your faith is built on anything other than the Son of God who spoke creation into existence, who came to earth as a baby in Bethlehem, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross for your sins, and then rose from the dead and ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father, if you're worshiping, serving, aspiring to be anything less than that failure's where you're headed because you're worshipping Crayola on copy paper so let me challenge you to get yourself out of the middle of your faith to worship a God who's so big you can't comprehend him to obey a God who sometimes gives you commands that you don't always understand. But you figure he's smarter than you are. To aspire to be like a Jesus whose life was so good that when he went to the cross, he didn't have to die for any of his own sins because he didn't have to. He was free to die for yours and mine. That's our perspective change. Can I pray for us? Father, I thank you. I thank you that, Lord, you and your son are so much bigger than me. I thank you that I don't even compare. 
I thank you that you are fully worthy of worship, of falling down, like everybody in the Bible, everybody in the Bible who saw God just fell on their face. Lord, thank you that you are a God who is big enough to be worthy of worship. Thank you that you are a God who is so much smarter than me and who still loves me. So that even when your commands don't make sense to me in the present second, I can follow them anyway because you know more than I know. And thank you that you are a God and you and your son are better than me. That you're worth aspiring to and not just aspiring to. That because you are so worshipable and so smart and so loving and so pure that as I strive to follow you you transform me it's not even up to me to fix me that you fix me when I submit to you so father I submit myself to you I'm changing my perspective from my faith being about me and acknowledging that my faith needs to be about you and I will do what you tell me to do so you can make me into who you want me to be. The best possible me. Father, as we go through really confusing times, it can get really challenging. Because it can get scary out there. It can get confusing out there. There's a lot going on that doesn't make sense. But you're bigger than all of it. And you're smarter than all of it. And you're better than all of it. And Father, we've got church family who are in really confusing, maybe even dangerous places because of all the confusion that's out there. And we pray to keep them safe and remind them how big you are and how much you love them. And Father, I pray you would transform us into the people you want us to be as we live with the awareness that you are bigger than me and smarter than me and better than me. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.